pleasure again to have a chance to introduce uh, Jerry Gabriel from Harvard for the Business School of MBA. Some of you may have um, been here last night and heard his public talk on tracking antimatter. And today uh, uh, he's going to focus uh, on more of the technical details, the uh, underlying physics. Uh, many of you know Professor Gabriel is a world leader in low energy fundamental physics tests of the simplest particles, uh, electron, proton, um, antiproton, positron, and making tests of um, uh, quantum electrodynamics. In fact, if you look at his, his record of what he's done, he has I think maybe the most precise measurement of uh, the fine structure constant, uh, the g minus 2 of the electron, um, proton magnetic moment, uh, very impressive results. And the, these are often measured on single particles with very high precision measurements. And not just precision, it's accurate measurements where people can go back and check the actual numbers later. And that's a much harder job than making a precise, precise uh, measurement. So um, let's see, uh, he has his undergraduate degree at Calvin College. Um, uh, Great school for undergraduate physics, uh, graduate degree at the University of Chicago, uh, as a postdoc and uh, tenure track professor at the University of Washington. Moved to Harvard in 1987, where he's built up a world leading program. Uh, and it, today we get a chance to hear of uh, the highest precision measurements in tests of QED. Um, you may have heard that Professor Gabriel is. Going to be moving over the next couple of years to Northwestern, where he's setting up a new center of fundamental physics of low energy and uh, looking to grow in that field. So please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Gabriel. Well, it's uh, an honor to be back here. Uh, I had a great uh, day or two. Uh, I even met a number of students to whom I taught quantum mechanics. And all of them told me, maybe they were just being polite, that I hadn't taught them anything wrong that they knew of. So that was a, <laughs> that's always a relief. Uh, um, so, and as Leo said, I am moving from Harvard to start a center for fundamental physics at low energy at Northwestern. Given that I've taught some fraction of the students here quantum mechanics and other courses, I'm hoping you might reciprocate by sending me some good students okay, over the next few years, especially if they're tenacious uh, and very skilled, and don't break more than $2,000 worth of apparatus per week, and you know things <laughs> like that. So those are the main characteristics. The topic today is the highest precision probes of the standard model and beyond. And I'm really going to focus on two different uh, e experiments. Um, and uh, to introduce those, both of the experiments I'll focus on will involve uh, uh, using the electron uh, for fundamental physics. Now, um, the basic idea of, uh, of the kind of physics that I like to do and the kind of physics that my uh, new center is going to specialize in and hopefully succeed at is, uh, is investigating fundamental physics. And I know the word fundamental is a little bit it's a little bit controversial because we live in a world where there seems to be effective field theory and there's, you know, there's uh, all sorts of energy and distance scales on, under which you're fundamental. But what I meant by that is, is fundamental in the sense we're really looking for the simplest possible uh, foundation for all, all of, uh, of physics. And you know, it's 60 years, uh, a little more now, since the discovery of parity violation. Um, and uh, you know, the, you can't help if you're doing this sort of physics to be inspired by the experiment of, of Madame Wu and the proposal of Li and Yang, of course, that uh, you know, parity violation hadn't really been looked for. And the kind of things that we hope to do in, um, in, in the center are, are, are basically uh, those sorts of things. Um, uh, the, 
I've said what's here on the top, so let me just point out, we're looking for new faculty members now and postdocs and graduate students. New faculty members, uh, they need to promise to do woo-like experiments, okay? Uh, the new postdocs, they don't have to make such a strong promise. They only need to promise that they aspire to do woo-like experiments. And the graduate students need to desire a woo-like adventure, even if they're you know, determined to get rich in their later life, okay? Uh, and so I hope, uh, I hope to get some people from here. All right, this is low energy particle physics, and if you think about the orders of magnitude of energy, the LHC, which is the big machine uh, these days at CERN, um, is uh, up here in the 10 TeV and a little above range, okay? And every tick mark here is an order of magnitude in energy, and we're doing fundamental physics down here. Last night I told you about setting traps for antiprotons, uh, positrons, uh, protons, um, anti-hydrogen atoms. That's all done sort of in this, uh, in this range, and, and I, we're gonna go down a little further Okay, down to cryogenic, temp oh, well, cryogenic temperatures, but with a dilution refrigerator, down to 100 millikelvin today. Okay, so that for those of you, I see some of you that I know aren't physicists in the audience who came back from last night, that's just the tenth of a degree above absolute zero. Okay, that's pretty cold. All right. Um, now, the standard model, uh, in physics we always talk about the standard model. It's not the most inspired name we've ever come up with, but then we have quantum numbers of truth and beauty and other uh, things that maybe could have been improved on. But the standard model is, uh, I'll say more about it in a moment, I like to call it the great triumph but also the great frustration of modern physics. Now what is the standard model? The standard model is basically a collection of particles, okay, and it's uh, some interactions between these particles, some symmetries of these particles, and uh, then you wrap it all up in quantum field theory, okay, and, and, and quantum field theory generates some symmetries as well. And uh, the, the standard model has been very flexible over the years. Uh, for example, we added the kobayashi Moskawa matrix at one point, right? You just added another matrix, sort of tacked it on the outside, and uh, said, okay, it all fits in the standard model. Well, that's just because we made the standard model a little bigger. So the standard model is like a, a dirty snowball, and you, everybody packs their, 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 their piece of snow in there, and as long as it all works. But at least for some of our taste, it has an awful lot of parameters in it. Okay, now that doesn't say maybe reality does have that many parameters, but there's quite a lot. And uh, we've tried efforts to unify some of these forces, which uh, many of you know about uh, in, in more detail than I. You know, they've resisted uh, the efforts of the physics community in some sense. So we get the impression that maybe this isn't complete. And then as I noted last night, there's, there's other reasons to know it's not complete. Now, the question is, the standard model, is it right, okay? And in science, unlike perhaps in the humanities, we actually have a doctrine of right and wrong, okay? We can ask a question, is it right and is it wrong? You can't ask if someone's novel is right or wrong, typically, so it's a little different, okay? But we test its predictions, and the low energy methods are the most precise. We test its symmetries. The low energy methods are the most precise. We look for new particles. That's where clearly the advantage goes to high energy experiments, okay, where you crash things together and you see what comes out. Uh, that's being done uh, very effectively right now at CERN. And, uh, and, and, you know, basically we're interested, can it predict the universe that we observe? Because in physics we never, as you all know, we never prove that something is right. We only fail to disprove it after a certain number of experiments. And if, if we do that, if we fail to disprove it enough, then eventually the community decides, and it's interesting sociology, but then we adopt whatever paradigm this theory is, is, is describing. That's the standard model right now. Now, the first part of my talk is what I'll call the greatest triumph of the standard model. Uh, now, my own point of view comes into that, of course, but uh, I'll explain why at least that's a defensible statement. And uh, what I'll be talking about is a magnetic moment. 
And so the first thing I'm going to do is say, well, what is, what is a magnetic moment and what is its natural scale? So this is the only derivation that we'll do today, at least I think. And so let's make a magnetic moment and we'll do a little more than dimensional analysis to see what size it is. So let's take a particle, charge E and mass M, let that particle go round and round in a circle so it'll have some velocity, which can be written as an omega, as an angular velocity omega times the radius, and it's a radius, okay? So that's pretty simple, basic uh, freshman physics. Now, circular motion, if it has one quantum of angular momentum, okay, the angular momentum then, L would be uh, 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 M times omega times R in terms of these uh, quantities. And if it's one quantum in quantum mechanics, we would set that equal to H bar because H bar is the unit, the basic unit, the quantum of angular momentum. Okay, now if we put this together, we can write that a magnetic moment, which in SI units is the current times an area, we can write down what the magnetic moment is here uh, in some detail. Okay, this current is pretty easy because there's one elementary charge going around once per revolution period. Okay, so here's the element, you know, current is charge per time. Okay, the charge is E and the time is one revolution period, which is two pi over omega. And then we multiply by the area, which is pi r squared, okay? So it's not such a hard derivation. We clear the constants and, and multiply it together, and what we get is that this magnetic moment is the charge times h bar times twice the mass of what, whatever particle we're dealing with. This means, well, this means, first of all, that if, if you have a, a, a particle that's heavier, you would naturally expect it to have a smaller magnetic moment. Okay, so when we, uh, I, I just briefly mentioned last night that we had measured the magnetic moment of an antiproton and a proton almost a thousand times more accurately than it, and compared them almost a thousand times more accurately than had been done before. Since the proton mass and the antiproton mass are 2,000 times bigger than the electron mass, that's a much smaller moment, okay? And that's one of the challenges of that measurement, okay? It, for an electron, this particular combination of constant Instance, this uh, natural size magnetic moment is called the Bohr magneton. Okay, so uh, an electron naturally would have a, 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 a magnetic moment of a Bohr magneton. Well, but it's really, I should put the sign of a charge here. I was just making the magnitude argument. Since this, this really we should have done this with the sign, we would predict that the, the magnetic moment actually would change sign with the charge. Okay, so a, pro a positron and an electron would have an oppositely signed magnetic moment. Okay, but this is the Bohr magneton. All right, so now let's look at the standard model's most precise prediction. Okay, and, and people often, like Leo did, talk about quantum electrodynamics. I don't like to do it that way, and I'll explain why uh, in, the, in the, the, these next two slides, okay? The standard model's most precise prediction is of the size of the electron magnetic dipole moment, okay? And, and here's the prediction. Well, it's a vector, this, uh, this magnetic moment, because it's, uh, well, it's a little bar magnet, right? It has a direction. And uh, Wigner-Eckhart theorem and all that stuff, uh, if we really believe it's a spin one-half particle as we do, then this vector has to be proportional to this vector. All the vector quantities for a simple enough system have to be proportional. I'll take the spin and I'll divide it by h bar over two because that's how we normalize a spin one-half uh, 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 angular momentum. I'm gonna put the Bohr magneton in on the off chance that the argument we just made has some validity, right? We argued what the basic size should be. And then just in case I got it wrong, I'm gonna write this, or put a fudge factor in here, which is this mu divided by the Bohr magneton, and that's dimensionless, and we can put in whatever number we, what we want to make it right. Okay, so it's an elaborate way to do it, but I want to focus on this quantity here, and I want to sort of not talk about this so much anymore. And, uh, but what, what I'm really doing when I do that is talking about the magnetic moment scaled in the most natural possible way. 
Okay, now here's the prediction of the standard model. And it's either beautiful or not so beautiful, depending on how you like series and things. Um, but here's the, the, this magnetic moment in Bohr magnetons. That's what it turns out we can measure, and I'll tell you how we do that. The Bohr magneton, you always measure something in terms of something else, right? A measurement in some sense is dimensionless, right? If I measure this table, I measure it in terms of the feet, uh, the, uh, the number of feet marked on my ruler and so on. Okay, and, and so uh, th this is in Bohr magnetons. The, the first term, uh, the, the, the leading term for a magnetic moment is not quantum electrodynamics. That's, well, maybe that's a bit of semantics, but what it is, it's, it's the prediction of the Dirac equation. That's most of the magnetic moment, okay? It's the moment that comes naturally out of the Dirac equation. If you want to call that quantum electrodynamics, I suppose you can, we, we typically don't. What we call quantum electrodynamics gives us, it's the interaction of ba basically uh, electrons and light, let's say it that that way, uh, but, but basically it's this series, this asymptotic series, which is an infinite series, uh, and, uh, and, and what, what, what th this is a series in terms of the fine structure constant, which perhaps you know, it's one over four pi epsilon naught e squared over h bar c, it's approximately equal over one, uh, to one over 137. Now Feynman famously said that every theorist should put 137 on their office wall to keep them humble, right? Because we have no idea how to calculate uh, the fine structure constant, even though it really sort of sets the scale of, of uh, not only atomic physics, but life in some sense, you know, chemistry, physics, uh, and so on. Okay, now this, this alpha is one over 137, so when we divide it by pi, which is about three, that's a couple hundred, so this series should converge pretty nicely, right? It's one over a couple hundred squared, cubed, the quadratic, and so on. And, uh, and then the coefficients here, C2, C4, this is second order, fourth order, sixth order, eighth order, and so on, tenth order. Uh, all of these coefficients are what are calculated uh, uh, by theorists, okay? And they've done a magnificent job of, of evaluating tens of thousands of Feynman diagrams now to, to, to do this, okay? Uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, my famous professor who had written a book assured us that, that this coefficient could never possibly be calculated. It was just too complicated, okay? It's now been calculated, and part of it's even been calculated analytically, and we know the next order as well, which has something like 20,000 Feynman diagrams in it, though most of the integrals there have been done um, numerically. Okay, and then, okay, not only is, is the Dirac term the leading term, quantum electrodynamics provides these terms, but they're the hadronic terms, which are also not part of quantum electrodynamics, are, their contribution is large enough that given our small error bars, okay, it's an important contribution. Okay, and then there's a weak contribution from the weak interaction as well. That turns out to be just smaller than what uh, than our error bars, but we wouldn't know that if the theorists couldn't tell us that by evaluating this term, or at least estimating this term to the first order, okay? And that's, of course, also a valuable contribution. Now, remarkably, these terms, these first three, are all known exactly. Now, if they're known exactly, why do I put uh, uncertainties in the last two digits here in parentheses, that's because the exact expressions dep depend on ratios of the lepton masses. And those have to be measured experimentally and put in. But they contribute, I mean, these uncertainties are negligible as far as uh, making a prediction which is uh, comparable in accuracy to our experiment. Uh, the, the uncertainties in these two coefficients, C8 and C10, are due to the, you know, integrating a zillion 12-dimensional integrals using Monte Carlo methods, okay, and estimating the, the errors on that. Here's the hadronic uh, estimate, 
Okay, calculation with its uh, uncertainty, and uh, the weak uh, um, contribution is, is a bit smaller. And I, I should say, I had nothing to do with calculating any of this. The theorists that did, they sometimes give really boring talks, but but it's uh, you know you see pages and pages of Feynman diagrams. But but on the other hand, it's a really tour de force to calculate this coefficient analytically. I must say. Um, and uh, they don't get enough credit for that, in my, in my view. OK. Now, the standard model, well, uh, two things about this expression. Notice that the right way to think about this is if we measure the magnetic moment, somebody else has to measure the fine structure constant before we can do business together. OK? And, and so the, the theory is really a bridge between two measured quantities. Now, that's not traditionally how it's been talked about. Traditionally, what's been talked about is measuring the fine structure constant, plugging it into this side, and predicting the magnetic moment. So this is called the prediction, but the prediction involves a theory and a measurement of the fine structure constant. And that harks back, I think, to the days when the fine structure constant was measured much more precisely than the magnetic moment. Uh, that situation has changed rather dramatically. Now, in fact, the way you get the fine structure constant in the tables of fundamental constants that you see in your textbooks, it takes our measurement and assumes this standard model expression is correct and solves for the, for the uh, you know, and solve for the fine structure constant. Okay, but that's just because we measure it more precisely. Okay. Um, well, what are you doing, Bill Gates? There we go. Okay, to measure the fine structure constant independently, I don't really have time to talk about that, though I'd like to, because I'd like to give Steve Chu a hard time, because he never measured it, okay, the way he, he promised me once in my living room that he would do. Well, I'm overstating it a bit. But okay, here's how you can measure the fine structure constant, okay? The fine structure constant is defined here. The Rydberg constant, which you're mostly familiar with here, gives you the structure of the energy levels in the hydrogen atom. If you mix these two things together, then, um, boy, I'm having trouble here. Microsoft PowerPoint is not responding. Wait for the program to respond. Is that the right answer? <laughs> Close the program. You know, I'm really embarrassed. Uh, Someone told me I shouldn't have bought this Lenovo computer that was built in China, but uh, there's too much military research going on on this campus, so they shut me down. Let's see here. I'm sorry. I don't think, I think this is a first for me. Oh, it's showing up up there. I see. Well, this is great. Plan B. Deathly silent here. I'm sorry, Leo. I'm embarrassing you, I know. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Do I want to recover my document? I have no idea whether I want to recover my document or not. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm going through the steps, actually, but uh, I really do hate that message about do I want to recover my document, but... It looks like I'm back, right? Okay, 
Now I have to sort of blank all of your minds, right? How do they do that in the movies? They push a button and all you, okay. Uh, this is the standard model's most precise prediction. Oh, this is a different talk, isn't it? No. Um, okay. Uh, all right. What you have to do is you have to measure the Rydberg constant. You have to measure an H over M. And Steve had some, uh, made some contributions to uh, suggesting how that could be done. And you have to measure some, some ratios of masses of ions. And if you put all of that together, you can get the fine structure constant. Okay. And right now, the weak link of this uh, measurement is the H over M. And the way it works is that in this business, if you make the weakest of a number of measurements, you get the, na the measurement named after you. So it's called the atom recoil measurement. It doesn't seem fair. Okay, the ion ratio guys never get mentioned because they do their job so well that they don't contribute much uncertainty. The Rydberg is so, so good that Ted Hinch never gets mentioned for measuring this, but okay, but that's how it, it all has to go together. Okay, I won't talk about that so much other than to say that right now this method of determining the fine structure constant is, is uh, uh, almost as accurate as when a, within a factor of three or four of what we can get by you know, assuming that the standard model is right and then inverting things, okay? And uh, that's actually uh, much better than the people who did the H over M measurement, Birabin's group in Paris, expected to do, and then they, it, sometimes experiments work a little better than what you think. Okay, uh, to give you a graphic idea of the size of these contributions, um, up here on top is, uh, is our measurement. Right, this is going to be a long day. Okay, so here's, here's our measurement, the size of the magnetic moment, and the dark part is the error in it. Okay, I just want to give you an idea of how the standard model contributions come in. Here's the Dirac contribution, which is dominant, right? Mostly Dirac got it right. Okay, there's the quantum electrodynamics terms. I've put the first uh, ten, uh, the, 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 through tenth order because those are the ones that we need. Okay, I won't go through the details of these different contributions here, but the uncertainties in these things from the numerical uncertainties are, are below our experimental error limit right now. The hadronic contribution is above our experimental precision, and I should say we're right now trying to make a measurement which is 10 times more uh, precise and more accurate. Okay, It's interesting, when we published our last result, I had a huge quarrel with the referee because he insisted that we put the word precision instead of accuracy in our paper. And uh, I said, well, precision, it means that, you know, I could measure it with a sawed-off ruler, and I could have the precision, and the number would be right. Accuracy, I told him, was what you bet. I said, one standard deviation of accuracy is what you bet your yearly salary on. Okay, I thought that would make him con convince him, but it didn't. So we compromised. I actually had to change it, and had to change the word to uncertainty to get the, the paper published, which was... Uh, a little bizarre, okay. He's a friend of mine, I know who he is, and I have my eye on him, but okay. Uh, all right, so the standard model's most precise prediction, if you put the best fine structure constant that's independent of our measurement in, and you, and you use this formula, here's the standard model's most precise prediction, here's the uncertainty in the last digits. I don't know all these digits, I don't expect you to, okay? I, it's just a lot of digits. It's sort of impressive that the standard model can predict so many digits, okay? Remember, this is the same standard model that I told you last night couldn't predict why we have a universe. It sort of predicts that we wouldn't have a universe, okay? And it can't account for dark energy, dark matter at this point, and so it's got, uh, at most, of what, it, most of its description of reality is wrong in, in some sense, okay. Now, how to determine the electron magnetic moment to three parts in 10 to the 13. That's our experimental uncertainty so far. That's a little ridiculous. But you know, it's irresistible to an experimenter. If the standard model makes such a precise 
prediction, how can you resist not trying to test it? How can you resist testing it, right? That's sort of the, the idea here. Okay, and we have a new measurement underway. The, the most important thing that you need to do these measurements is you need good students and stable funding, right? Good students are even more important than the stable funding, okay? The experiments take longer than usual. This is 20 years and eight PhD theses. There's been more than that now. And in order to keep this sort of thing going, you have to have a steady output of other results, which also seem interesting enough to the community that they allow you to continue. Okay, the publications come less often, and it's, uh, it's harder, at least for young people, to attract and sustain funding. I hope that our new center will help with that a bit by making this sort of physics more visible. I think that here at Stanford, you have more than your fair share of such physics as well. And so I think you guys pulling together also makes a, a, a strong case for this sort of physics. Okay, now here's how you do the measurement. Well, the basic idea, I showed you a picture like this last night. This time there's an electron going around in a six Tesla magnetic field. And uh, you know the classical view is there's a circular motion and it's 150 gigahertz. Not especially easy frequency to operate at. It's in the microwave uh, radiation, uh, microwave range, a uh, wavelength of two millimeters. So it's hard to do direct detection and stuff at that frequency. Now, that's not really what we want. We want to make it like an atom. That's sort of like a Rydberg atom, okay? And who wants a Rydberg atom? You want a real atom with energy levels that you care about, okay? But first of all, we have to keep that atom from coming apart. So we put negative charges above and below. And so the particle, when it comes up, is repelled by a like charge, okay? The, I got that wrong on my slide last night, okay. All right, now we don't really want that. We want to make energy levels. So, so what we do is we cool the motion of this so much, okay, that we sit in, uh, in, in, in the low quantum levels, okay? In fact, we'd like to sit just in the ground state. And, uh, and then we'd like to put some photons into our system and make it excite to the first excited state. So we do an experiment just like you'd imagine in high school chemistry. You're in the ground state and you put it up to the first excited state. But this isn't a real atom, this is our artificial atom. Why make an artificial atom when God has provided so many perfectly good atoms? Well, the reason is this is kind of a distorted atom. We want it to be, we want it, we want it bound so we have a lot of time to make a precise measurement. But what we don't want is, is, is we, we don't want it so tightly bound that when you measure the properties, you're measure the, measuring the properties of the atom. You want to measure the properties of the particles themselves. Okay, so you want this weakly bound artificial atom. Okay, now in order to do this and, and be in the ground state, this is what the the electron probability distribution looks like in the ground state, it's really boring. Nothing's going around, right? You know, we call these stationary states, okay? Because nothing happens, okay? And then we want to go up to the first excited state. Now we see this sort of hollowed out distribution of electron as you go off the center axis of this homemade atom. So we'd like to flip back and forth between these two states. Well, first of all, we've got to get the particles in the ground state and get them to stay there. Well, how do we do that? Well, the basic idea is uh, the energy splitting between here, if you'll let me switch to temperature units, so putting in a Boltzmann constant where I need it, this, this energy is equivalent to 7.2 Kelvin of energy. So in order to, to get in, in, to have the Boltzmann factor put all the probability down here, we have to be at a temperature that's much less than seven Kelvin. And so that's why we use a dilution refrigerator and we lower our apparatus temperature down to a tenth of a Kelvin, okay? Now, you have to think about this maybe to think what it means to have one particle in thermal equilibrium. Right, uh, uh, thermal equilibrium is usually an ensemble of particles, right? And here we have one particle, okay? So you can think about that for a moment. I'll come back to it in just a moment and give you a quiz, okay? All right, so the quantum measurement that we do, well, if we have one particle and we're in a quantum state, we know that we have the cyclotron energy levels, so I've written the harmonic oscillator energy levels, n plus one half, this is the quantum number, h bar times the cyclotron cyclotron frequency, but of course this electron also has spin up or spin down with respect to the magnetic field, 
Okay, and uh, so so if I if I just flip the spin, spin up to spin down, then I get the difference between this with m equals uh, one half and minus one half, just gives me h bar omega s. That turns out to be twice times the magnetic moment times the magnetic field. That's not so good that the splitting is proportional to the magnetic field since the magnetic field isn't perfectly stable. Okay, and so it's going to change as the magnetic field changes in time. The cyclotron energy is, if we change the quantum number by one, h bar omega c is twice times the Bohr magneton times b. Notice the nifty thing. If we take the ratio of these two frequencies, what we get is the magnetic moment in Bohr magnetons, just what we want. Now, this is perfect for a precise measurement. Okay, because there's nothing in physics that we can measure better than a frequency. Okay, because the art of timekeeping is very well developed. The only thing we can measure better than a frequency is a ratio of frequencies. Because now the frequency only has to stay constant during the time we're making one frequency measurement till the next. Right, so, so this, this is perfect. So this is the, 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 the really nice feature of this measurement. Now there's more stuff going on here which I, I'll sweep under the rug for now. Okay, this is a picture of, of what our accelerator looks like, our homemade atom looks like. This is the nucleus you're seeing of the homemade atom, right? It's on the outside, right? And the ele one electron sits inside and it sits there for months at a time. We have good students here, one guy who harasses them, and, and then, then lots of apparatus, okay? And, uh, uh, well, maybe I should say what some of this is. This is the... This is a doer, and underneath this floor, there's another doer that has a six Tesla uh, solenoid uh, you know, to make the strong magnetic field. There's a dilution refrigerator, which is lowered through the ceiling down into this apparatus because it's long and skinny. Okay, so there's lots of technology going on. Okay, now what sorts of things do we see? Well, what I'm showing you here is the energy in the the energy that we measure uh, uh, basically in the cyclotron motion over an hour. So each of these slices is one hour. Okay, and this vertical scale is energy in units of zero, one, and two. Okay, and what I claim is this is a quantum non-demolition measurement of the energy. Now some of you use quantum non-demolition measurements. It's a common technique now in, in, in quantum optics. We've been using it for a lot of years, I think even before the term became popular. Okay, the basic idea of a quantum non-demolition measurement is that the, when you make a repeated measurement, the measurement itself doesn't change the state that you're measuring. Okay, so you can put something else in, you can do something else, like put some photons in the cavity and then measure it again and see if the state has changed. So the measurement itself isn't going to do your, your, your experiment damage. I could talk more about that, but I won't. Okay, so this is, uh, what are we seeing here? Well, we see sort of a ground state, if you look at this long enough, you see a first excited state, and then you see a second excited state, and then you see some little pointy things in between. What are the little pointy things? Well, that's when the particle starts to jump up to the first excited state, but it decays in a time short compared to the averaging time that we need to determine which quantum state we're in. Now, we do have to average for a fraction of a second. It's not so surprising. There's one electron making signal, and there's 10 to the 23, 10 to the 24 electrons making noise. Okay, so you have to exploit the fact that you're narrow band and, and do some averaging. Now, why, does, why do we excite this at all? Well, we're just in a cavity, a small uh, cylindrical cylinder. I'll show you a picture of that uh, in what comes. And, and basically, that small cylinder makes black body photons because it's at a certain temperature. This is at 4 Kelvin. It, let's take this, this well-separated uh, uh, thing. What, what happens is a black body photon comes in. The system absorbs it, jumps up to the first excited state, and then it jumps down either by emitting a photon by spontaneous emission, or it absorbs, a, or, or a, 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 it, you know, there's a stimulated emission that comes from another black body photon. We don't know which. As we lower the temperature, you can clearly see there are less black body photons in the cavity. So when we get down to 1.6 Kelvin, we only see about one of these transitions per hour. 
Okay, and here what's happening is undoubtedly a black body photon was absorbed, that made the excitation, and almost certainly, though I can't say positively, this is a spontaneous emission, because on average we'd expect it to be another hour before a black body photon came by to stimulate the emission down. Okay, so the, the, and then if you go below 100 millikelvin, then you don't see any transitions at all. Okay, I mean the, 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 the lifetime there is, 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 is enormously long. Okay, now if we make a probability factor here, the probability of being in the ground state, the first excited state, and the second excited state, we can extract the temperature. And in fact, the temperature that the electron thinks it's at is the same as the temperature we measure with a, a, a temperature sensor, a ruthenium oxide sensor uh, or a carbon sensor, we use both, you know, on the side of, of the apparatus, right down to 1.6 Kelvin. Below, uh, below a tenth of a Kelvin, you know, there's never any transition, so the concept of temperature doesn't even really make any sense, okay? Uh, and, and temperature doesn't really matter. Now, Remember I asked you, what does it mean to be in thermal equilibrium? Well, if you look at any of these traces, clearly you're not in thermal equilibrium. You're in one quantum state or another. It's, it's painfully clear, right? On the other hand, if you take many hours of these, many slices like this, and average them together, then's when you get a Boltzmann factor. Okay, and that Boltzmann factor is the thermal state. The ther so, so basically we take you know, all this good data we have and we average it all away because quantum mechanics can't describe what's really going to happen on an event by event basis except in a simulation sort of sense. Okay, now we inhibit spontaneous emission. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, a particle in a magnetic field uh, of, of our size will radiate in, in about a tenth of a second. Tenth of a second is too short for us to average enough to see which quantum state we're in. So what we do is we put this cavity around. The cavity has radiation modes in it. You know, you had to study them from Jackson, TM modes, TE modes, TEM modes, that awful chapter five or whatever. I think it's still branded in my brain. Okay, but this is why you have to solve that because the density of states is, is you know, follows this resonance profile in the cavity. And only on a, a resonant peak do you have a density of state. So the particle looks out and says, boy, I'd really like to radiate today. Uh, but oops, I'm between cavity modes, so there's no density of states. I have to wait a while. Okay? And so we can inhibit spontaneous emission or enhance it if we want by tuning the electron frequency to be on or off the resonance with these cavity modes. Okay, and that, that instead of a tenth of a second, then we get 16 seconds. And how do we measure this? Well, we make a histogram of the amount of time we spend in the, in the excited state. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic idea. All right. I don't know what's happening here. Come on, baby, you can do it for me. Oh no. All right, restart the program, close the program. Wait, oh no, here it started again. Okay, oh, I'm gonna have to bring this to an early close here, okay. There's many other tricks that we use in, in, in the experiment, and I, I, I want to get on to another experiment, so I'm going to stop talking about this experiment pretty quick. But one of the things we do is, I mentioned it last night, we, we have, we've modified the superconducting solenoid, so when the subway goes by the lab, uh, you know, 100 meters away and changes the magnetic field, an extra current gets induced in the solenoid and cancels things out. Things are really a little more complicated in the energy level business because special relativity is alive and well, so the cyclotron energy levels are not exactly equally spaced. They're equally spaced to within a part in 10 to the nine, Okay, but our measurement precision is much better than that, so we see that they're a part in 10 to the 9 closer as you go up. And then there's two cyclotron ladders because they're spin up and spin down. And for our first, for our, our latest measurement, we started in this state and we either went this direction or went this direction to probe the spin frequency or the cyclotron frequency, and then we uh, uh, got a result. 
Okay, well, I'm futzing around with this computer too much, so let me just say, the standard model's greatest triumph, in my view, is that the theorists are able to use the standard model, both the uh, Dirac part, the QED part, the hadronic and the weak part, to predict this number, and we measure essentially the same thing. Here's the prediction, and here's our measurement right here. Okay, it's about 15 times uh, more precise, more accurate than the uh, result that helped uh, Hans Daimel get his Nobel Prize uh, some years ago. Um, so it's 2.8 parts in 10 to the 13. Okay, and now we can determine the fine structure constant by using what we measure and inverting this expression. And if we do that, here's the value that we get compared to the other values. I've already told you this, so there's no real new information here. We get the uh, fine structure constant more precisely, more accurately, in fact, I think, than uh, anyone else, at least if the standard model is right. Um, but the an important thing is that some of the measurements, the quantum Hall effect and, and the, those solid state measurements, the Josephson junction effect that I grew up with thinking as the be most precise way to measure the fine structure constant, they don't even come close to fitting on this graph. Okay, they're, they're just so enormously big, the error bars, and some of them don't even, aren't even consistent with these measurements. Now, uh, there's a big development that happened uh, in 2012. Here's again our measurement accuracy. Here's the theoretical accuracy as it stood uh, in 2012. This is from the various terms in the QED calculation. And uh, the theorists calculated the 10th order and that knocked the, 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 um, the uncertainty down a lot, which means that if we now measure the more precisely, we can determine the fine structure constant more precisely if indeed the standard model is correct. And so we hope to do that. Now, this measurement also puts a limit on physics beyond the standard model. Okay, physics beyond the standard model, here's the argument. Basically, this expression that I showed you, okay, corrections due to the um, uh, quantum electrodynamics, the hadronic and weak, also new physics. If there's, if there's new particles inside of, if there's particles, ingredient particles in the electron, then one would expect to have a shift. And that's the reason that the proton magnetic moment and the antiproton magnetic moment don't work from this formula, okay? Because there's extra structure going on. And so uh, I don't have time to, 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 to go for this, but let's just say that the error bars in our experiment essentially establish that the ingredients of, that are in the electron, if there are some, have a mass, if you pull them all out and set them on the table separately, okay, a, a mass of about a t, greater than a TeV per C squared. Now, for a, a particle that's a half MeV, that's a whale of a lot of binding energy, okay? So the electrons that are in our body are really strange particles, right? If they have ingredients, as some of us think they must have, okay, the ingredients, uh, I'm, well, there's a whale of a lot of binding energy. Okay, that's, that's all I have to say. 20, 20, uh, uh, 20 million times more than the electron mass. Okay. Um, I, I just a, a side thing I won't take. I think we could actually measure the muon magnetic moment in a trap rather than a storage ring as is being done at Fermilab right now. Uh, we're not trying to do it because I don't feel I can do research on one more continent, okay, because I'm already going to Geneva all the time. Uh, but if one of you wants to go to Japan a lot, uh, you can come and talk to me. I have a project for you. Okay. Um, all right. Let's... Uh, Despite the great success of the standard model, it can't be the whole story. It can't explain, as I talked about last night, how a matter universe exists. Okay, gravity doesn't fit so well. You can't renormalize it, at least. Uh, it can't explain inflation, can't explain dark energy. So the standard model is the great frustration uh, and as well as the great triumph of modern physics. So let me just skip to a, another measurement that we found uh, irresistible, okay? Um, we've done lots of different measurements here, so I'm going to skip all of these. Um, I guess we've done too many measurements here. Um, okay. So. We can also test using low energy methods. 
whether proposed improvements to the standard model uh, are right or not by looking for places where the standard model and proposed improvements like super, super symmetric models are the ones you've all heard of, I think, whether these two things disagree in their predictions. And then we can try and use these low energy methods to see what's right. Now I've been talking about the magnetic moment Okay, which is proportional to the spin. If the electron has an electric dipole moment for the non-physicist, that means that the charge distribution is squished a little bit, okay? We should be able to write a similar expression, scaling it as a spin, because that electric dipole moment would also be a vector, and we should look for this, this constant. Okay, uh, physicists didn't look for it for many years because it violated two of the sacred symmetries, okay, P and T. I won't go into that. It's sometimes a mistake to be persuaded by your own propaganda, okay, but we're starting to look right now. Okay, the standard model predicts a non-zero electric dipole moment of the electron, but it predicts it in, in fourth order. Okay, which means the estimated size of that is about 10 to the minus 38 electron charges times centimeters. That's the, the unit of charge that's always used. Since the measurement, the best measurement when we started was about 10 to the minus 27 centimeters, that's a long way away. 10 orders of magnitude is too much for my optimism even. I think it's gonna be hard to measure for a while. Uh, the reason is the, the standard model to couple in the CP violation you need to have a, a magnetic moment has to, you know, has to couple it in via the Kobayashi Moskawa matrix and that comes in only at high order. Okay, now the extensions to the standard model like supersymmetric models take all the particles and add a bunch of supersymmetric particles which by coincidence none have been detected so far. Okay, which is an unusual situation. Maybe we're gonna get a news flash soon that that's changed at, at the LHC, we all hope so, uh, but, but let's see. Okay, we formed the ACME collaboration to use low energy methods uh, to try and measure the electron electric dipole moment. Here's uh, John Doyle, my colleague, Dave DeMille from Yale and myself. Here's the people who did the real work. Uh, a number of them got PhDs for doing this. It was really a very nice crew and uh, it worked very well together. Uh, some of you know that I was proud until this time, until we got the result to have never submitted a paper to either nature or science, okay? Uh, uh, and, uh, but my collaborators, my, the PIs outvoted me, so we ended up on the cover of science for this measurement. Um, but how do you measure the electron electric dipole moment? Well, if you have a Hamiltonian, and you have a small electric dipole moment, then you better put a big electric field in there to make some effect that you can see, some frequency shift uh, or energy shift. So the big, if this is small and no one's detected it so far, so we make this as big as we can. That's the basic idea. Now, an electric field on an electron, that's bad news, right? You'd accelerate the particle right out of the apparatus and the experiment is over. So you can do the experiment with neutrons that way, but not with uh, electrons. So we always do these sorts of experiments within atoms and molecules using the internal field of the atom or molecule as the field which is in the D dot E. So it's the effective electric field dotted into the electric dipole moment. Okay, I won't talk about that. Uh, we're using molecules now. I don't like molecules. Shallow famously said here many years ago that a diatomic molecule has at least one atom too many, and that was always my attitude as well. I still sort of feel that way, but the effective electric field inside of our molecule is of order, well, it's a little lower now, but the first estimates were about 100 gigavolts per centimeter. Try and make a field like that in your lab once. You know, it just can't be done. And moreover, you can steer that in the lab by taking just a couple of volts per centimeter field and reversing it, and this molecule and this field obediently changes with you. So it's, it's a, just a remarkable way to do this. And there are people like Ed Hines from Imperial College College, who was a pioneer of this sort of thing. My collaborator, David DeMille, also worked on these in uh, another molecule. It, it didn't pan out, but he had some good experience there. Now, our, 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 well, this is a little busy and I'm running a little low on time, so let me just say that for me, I think of this as a two-state system. 
Okay, if you look enough and you find the right two states, you can find two states which are a, a degenerate. And if you have an electric field and turn it on and there's an electric dipole moment of the electron, one level goes up and the other level goes down. Okay, that's the basic idea. So we're looking for an energy splitting. So that's really simple. The molecule also has a nice thing where the magnetic moment is particularly small because an orbital and spin component cancel each other, which is nice because that way uh, magnetic field fluctuations and stuff are less of a problem. But the, the energy splitting that you get, and this is, this is an energy splitting that corresponds to the error bar we got in our measurement, is not too big. You know, if, if you're an accelerator, a particle physicist, high energy physicist, you would say it's 7 times 10 to the minus 30 TeV. Now, that's maybe fudging because you put the, the TeV on here. But if you put it in, in, in our units, low energy units, it's 7 times 10 to the minus 18 eV. That's not so many electron volts either. In frequency units, it's 2 millihertz. So you can't just you know, put a, 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 a source, a laser source, microwave source, or whatever, and resolve this, because these levels are, are, are much too close to each other. So what do we do? We use standard low temperature, uh, low, low energy tricks. We make a superposition of these two states. And because they have a slightly different energy, if we let them evolve in an electric and a magnetic field, they're going to pick up a different phase, each of these two states. And then we measure the phase on the other end. And we can control, by controlling the polarization of our laser light, we can control the initial angle. Uh, you know, the phase angle in this uh, coherent superposition of the two states. And by detecting properly and changing polarization, we change it every five microseconds, we can detect what the polarization is. Uh, we can detect what the, the, the angle is there and get out this phase. And the part that we're interested in is the part that's proportional to the electric field, the time it takes, the time we let it drift in this sort of amplification region, this drift region, and we can get out the, uh, 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 the the dipole moment. OK. The, the, the basic schematic is the source is made. It's a specialty of the Doyle group to use ablation. A uh, big laser uh, hits, a, hits a, a, a thorium dioxide target, and stuff happens. OK. Uh, they claim to understand some of what the stuff happens, but it's, it's kind of a bit of a mess. But out comes some THO. OK, just uh, uh, thorium monoxide. It goes through some preparation region where we do some rotational cooling. It goes between some electric field plates, which are glass plates, which have tin oxide on them so we can make an electric field. Okay. Okay, we can see these beautiful fringing patterns as we change, you know, these angles between the states. Okay, so we have, uh, uh, if we sit on one of these cr uh, zero crossings here, then if we put on a little bit of electric field, the phase will go down one direction. If we take off the electric field, the phase will go the other direction. Okay, this will be determined, uh, depending on whether or not we have this moment. We can do very fast switches. We switch the direction of the electric field. It turns out in our molecule, we can actually, by changing the laser frequency, we can select two states or two other states. And those are identical almost, except that the internal direction of the electric field is different. So we do one, then the other, then we subtract. So it's always doing one thing, doing another thing, and subtracting out and looking at the differences. Compared to other measurements like this, we do these switches relatively fast, uh, and that gives us some advantages. Our, our field is, uh, well, the first estimates were 100 gigavolts per centimeter. Uh, there's more recent F, uh, estimates of 88 gigavolts per centimeter, the effective electric field in the molecule. Theorists have to provide these. It doesn't really matter the differences between here for us, for the limits that we're setting. OK, uh, but right now it's settled at about 88 in the most recent paper. Here's the result that we had. We were blind to the result, and we did 40 different systematic checks. OK, very tedious business. And in the end, we sat there with bottles of wine and unblinded ourselves after we we had decided to publish. And uh, this was our result. It was consistent with zero, but it was about a factor of 12 more precise than had, had ever been done before. OK, now uh, the electron magnetic moment measured in 2002 by the famous measurement of Cummins was at about 2 times 10 to the minus 27. Ed Hines improved it to about by a factor of 2 almost uh, 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 in 2011. And we improved things by a factor of 12, OK, to about uh, the 10 to the t minus 28 uh, 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 level. 
Now, uh, I was telling Peter, Peter, if you're in the audience here somewhere, we actually don't measure the, uh, the electric dipole moment alone. There's also a scalar coupling uh, uh, constant that we determine a limit on. Uh, I won't talk about that now, but I'd be happy to after if you want to ask. In terms of particle physics uh, uh, numbers, what do we do? Well, here's the electric dipole moment as a particle physicist would write it. Basically, there's some sort of coupling constant, and the power depends on whether you're coupling to one or two level diagrams. We it, it, it do both. There's a, we estimate with both. There's the mass of the electron divided by whatever mass scale you think you're investigating. That would typically be the mass scale that the LHC is at, because else they would have seen particles that were lighter than that, we hope. There's some sort of coupling to CP violation with the phase. And when you put this all together, we're probing at what we claimed was the three, to, uh, the three TeV or one TeV stage. Now, my theoretical colleague said, whoa, what do you, why, that should be 30, 10 to 30 TeV. It's because we put a, a prefactor of 0.1 and just assume nature would be unkind. And apparently in particle theory, you don't do that. You just always assume nature is kind. Okay, so, so basically th this is what we did. We improved things. All of these models here are getting kind of hard to, uh, uh, to take as seriously as one did before. There are still some models that we haven't um, excluded. Uh, we're working on them. Uh, here's another uh, interesting plot that Fang came up with. I just added some stuff. This is the UW uh, nuclear uh, 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 moment measurement. Here's our measurement. This is a constraint on some of the supersymmetric particles. Notice that we make limits that are far uh, more stringent than what has been possible still at the LHC uh, and, and so on. Okay. Let, we're, uh, we're almost done here, so let me just say there are other people doing these measurements. Uh, Ed Hines' group continues at, at Imperial College. At Jello, they're trying to do a, a very nice measurement. No result yet. Okay, Penn State and, and U Texas at Austin, no result yet. Um, okay. We're in the process now of doing a new measurement, and I'm going to conclude on this note. We're actually taking the data right now, and I'll show you some examples. So if you just take this plot and say, how much better are we going to do, we're going to put it way off the scale now. Okay, So we're going to really set uh, by far the highest energy limit. Here's 30 TeV. We're going to be way above that Okay, uh, uh, coming up. And so in terms of this graph, we're going to push it by at least an order of magnitude. Well, what, what did we do? Well. We improved the molecular flux that we had. Let me just give you a feeling for some of the improvements. To excite the two levels in our first generation experiment, we just wanted to get running as soon as possible. We excited a molecular level with a laser. It rained down on six different levels, two of which we wanted to use. Okay, we blew away all the other population and made a dark state of those two levels to have phase coherence. That took away another factor of two. An extremely inefficient way to excite these two levels. Instead, we went to Styrap, okay, where we did a coherent excitation, okay, of just the two levels that we want. That gives us one factor, okay, and then we, uh, there's lots of stable lasers for that. Here's the punchline, though. This is the signal for a molecular pulse that we saw in our first generation experiment. Now, you don't see a pulse here because on the same scale, I put what our new pulse looks like, okay? And it's, it's four or 500 times bigger. Okay, here's a log plot so you can, I can prove to you that there was a pulse uh, under here. Okay, so this is an enormous improvement. We should be able to improve our measurement by at least the square root of four or, or 500, I would say. And uh, he, this just is hot off the press from last week. This is the, uh, the phase uncertainty. Remember, in looking at these fringes that we have now compared to what we did in generation one. This is not an error bar yet because we have to do the systematic studies and we haven't done that yet. We've looked at the, mo the worst systematic that we had last time, and that one we killed. We made it go away. But there's one other now, a new one, that's poked up at the new level of sensitivity that we have to understand. Here's the various uh, improvement factors. Okay, it comes out to five, 500. And then I think in the future, I think there's at least another order of magnitude possibly coming as we switch from an ablation source to a thermochemical source. Okay, here's the summary. Despite a 12-fold improvement, there's no electron uh, EDM yet. 
That's a little disappointing because, of course, it would have changed our lives if we had found it. Okay, uh, from a scientific point of view, it's probably just as significant one way or another because we know that some of these models that have been proposed to improve the standard model just aren't correct, and it's important to know that. We're now probing for new physics way above the TEV scale. Okay, it's comparable or higher than the LHC. And the, the substantial improvement in EDM uh, precision seems possible. In fact, it's demonstrated, so we're plunging on. I would be terribly surprised if over the next year, okay, we don't, aren't able to report at least an order of magnitude improvement on what we had before. And uh, of course, it would be really great to discover that the electron charge is a bit squished, and we'll see if we do. All right, I hope this has given you a little bit of a flavor of these sorts of low energy particle physics experiments. I thank you for your attention. Time for a couple of questions. I know some of you may want to uh, escape, but um, I think some people may also want to hang around for a couple of questions. Anybody? So, so what did you learn differently from measuring the neutron electric type? Oh, well, the, I, I, I skipped this. I mean, my computer was giving me trouble. I apologize. I would have gotten to a couple of more slides. I think it's really important to, move, to measure the neutron electric dipole moment because there because it you know it the strong it, the, the strong interaction shall we say contributes to it. There's a much richer uh, possibility, uh, a number of reasons that we could, one could have an electric dipole moment of the neutron than with the electron. The electron, you know, we either have an electric dipole moment from the, 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 the moment itself or this coupling of the electron to the nucleus. There's about 10 or 11 such parameters, okay, in, in, the, in the neutron case, okay, and, and th th that's a different, you're probing different physics. So I think you really want to probe both uh, the electron and the neutron and the proton if you can, okay? Now, the neutron people have been doing this a long time, so the increases are not as rapid, though, on paper now, they're looking for factors of 10, or I've even seen 100 claimed. Okay, they're having trouble getting the, the neutron flux right now the, of the cold neutrons that was promised. Okay, so that's a big setback right now. But, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's three or four large collaborations that are working on this. It's considered a priority in nuclear physics. So can you also play some tricks with neutrons using, I don't know, atoms, molecules? Well, there's lots of tricks that you play with neutrons. I'd be happy to talk to you about afterwards. Mostly it's doing the magnetrometry, but you, you have very cold neutrons that you can hold in a bottle, and you can detect their polarization after a long time. I mean, there, there's lots of tricks in the neutron thing. It's a, if you don't know about such experiments, it's certainly worth reading about them, because they're, they're, they're very delightful, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are many electrons in one of those molecules. Yes. Uh, what does that do to the yeah, well, the, the, that, that's why you, you have to be a skilled theorist to calculate this. But what we're actually doing is looking at two valence electrons, mostly one, the one on the outside. And then you can correct by adding different configurations to deal, to deal with at an appropriate level of accuracy for the electrons in the inner shells. Okay, but basically the way to think about it is there's one electron on the outside, and it's in the residual field of the, you know, between, between the nuclei. Okay, and then we reverse that by reversing the laboratory field and so on. Okay. What's the QND measurement on the cycle? How do you measure the type? How do you do a quick QND measurement on the cyclotron motion? How do we do a QND measurement? On the cyclotron. Yeah, okay. Well, a Q&D measurement, as you know, but maybe for others to say, if you have a system and a detection system and a coupling, if the coupling commutes with the system Hamiltonian, that's technically then a Q&D system. And, and our system is that uh, we're trying to detect frequencies about 200 gigahertz, which is too hard for us, okay? Because, you know, it's, it's hard to get really sensitive detectors and stuff for that. And so what we do is we monitor the up and down motion in this trap along the magnetic field direction. 
Okay, and it turns out that when we flip the spin, uh, when we flip the spin, or we make a one quantum excitation, the effective well of the of the um, uh, 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 of, of the this up and down motion changes because we put a small gradient in the magnetic field, which goes as z. This axis squared. So the, the so so the magnetic field a, a term that is 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 a magnetic moment times a magnetic field if there's a gradient will acquire a z squared dependence. That's exactly what the harmonic oscillator has. So basically, then we measure a frequency of an orthogonal motion to learn about which state we're in. And that frequency shifts by parts in 10 to the 8 or something like that. And we're able to resolve that. We have you know, cryogenically cooled uh, field, field effect transistors and you know, stuff like that that we use. Did that answer your question? OK, last question. What's your uh, reference to some, some news coming out of the LHC regarding supersymmetry? Just a, a wish, or is there an actual rumor? <laughs> it was very nice to address you, and I have no further comment to make at this time. So, I, y you'll, you'll never know. You'll never know. All right. Well, why don't we make sure it's around nice time? I'm sorry about the problem with the computer.